Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God for our sermon this morning is our second lesson for today, recorded in the letter of James. Fellow redeemed in Christ Jesus, you just sang in the sermon hymn, My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray. Prayer is the particular possession of Christians, much more than mere whistling in the dark, and certainly not a waste of time. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of Calvary. He does hear us pray when we pray to Him, or to the Father, or to the Son, or to all three of them at once. Secure in our familial relationship with the Lord God through faith in Jesus Christ, this morning we want to look at three reasons the Christian ought to pray. God tells us to pray, we need the Lord's help, and prayer changes things. We may not always know how to rebut people's arguments against prayer. You've heard them or something similar to them. There's not really a God out there who is listening. Or prayer is nothing more than simply talking to yourself, kind of a psychological crutch. Or God is going to do what he wants to do anyway, so what you call prayer really has no effect. So it doesn't matter one way or the other. Remember, it's not necessary that I'm able to answer all those doubts and questions in order to pray. I don't need to understand perfectly how prayer works in order for me to pray. We don't always have to do that in other things either, understand how they work. I often think of this when I'm flying and I'm 32,000 feet above the earth in this narrow metal tube. I thought of it the other day when I was Skyping one of our newest members who lives in Germany. I pray, first of all, because God wants me to pray. There's no confusion or misunderstanding about that. There are many places in the scripture where God expresses his desire that I go to him in prayer. Think of what God says through the psalmist in Psalm 51, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you will honor me. Jesus told his disciples to always pray so that they do not grow weak and fall into temptation. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians that we are to pray continually. And here, in James' letter, he tells Christians, pray for the afflicted, pray for the sick, pray for one another. There may be times when the enemies of prayer or the enemies of God make us a bit confused in our explanations about things, but there can be no misunderstanding and no confusion when it comes to what our God tells us, his children, about prayer. God wants us to pray. Think of that little boy whose mother tells him to go wash his hands before dinner. The little boy may think that her desire is unnecessary or foolish, but she is his mother and she loves him and cares about him. She wants him to do that and she knows what's best for him. So as her child, he will want to do what she wants him to do for no other reason than she is his mother. She loves him, cares about him. He loves her and ought to obey her as a sign of his love for her. 
And so it is when it comes to prayer with God. God has told us that he wants us to pray. He is our Father. He loves us. He knows what's best for us. And so we love him and do what he tells us to do. The second reason that we Christians ought to pray is that we need the Lord's help. Why do we always need to be reminded to pray? Why does our prayer life often grow infrequent? We don't pray as much as we ought to or as fervently as we ought to. There are those times when we must remind our children, don't forget to say your prayers. And maybe that reminder even comes to us as well. The reason those things are true, I'll suggest, is that a lot of the times we just have things too good. Things go too easily for us in our lives. When is the last time really any of us worried about where our next meal or our next night's sleep would come from? When was the last time that any of us were really hungry or cold or lacked something that we need? And because of that, we lose our sense of needing the Lord's help. And when we do that, our prayer life can grow weak and infrequent. Because the Lord loves us, he reminds us that we need his help. And so God sends us problems in the form of, of illness or want or trouble or grief. James refers to this in our text. Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Is any of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him. The Lord reminds us that we need him. The Lord reminds us that what we confess in Psalm 121, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, is not merely theoretical. We would not forget to pray often and fervently, even when we have all the good things in life, if we would remember primarily our spiritual need. And that spiritual need is the forgiveness of our sins. Each and every day we sin against God and against one another. So even if our stomachs are full, if we're warm, if we don't have to worry about anything in life, if we think about our sins, if we think about our great spiritual need, then that certainly would remind us that we need the Lord's help. And so James mentions these. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Our very failure to appreciate that we need the Lord's help is a sin. And so we need to remember and then pray for that forgiveness, to pray for that help that we receive only in Jesus Christ. And receive it we do, don't we? Daily we sin much and indeed deserve nothing from God but his wrath and punishment. And yet each and every day we receive the help of the Lord to solve that problem. We hear it virtually every Sunday. We know it in our hearts when we pray for forgiveness each day. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. This morning, you heard your worship leader say, by the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. We are at peace with God. And then you added your amen.
to that. Such forgiveness that we need from our Lord makes us happy. And James tells, James tells us that it is in that happiness that we also pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Last Wednesday when I was sitting in my office, I heard the preschool children singing a prayer in song to the Lord as their hearts were filled with happiness. As they sang to God, keep me, keep me as the apple of your eye. The psalms, the hymns, the spiritual songs that we sing around the house or in the worship service are really prayers of thanksgiving that God has supplied our needs, particularly our spiritual need of forgiveness. They are our thanksgiving prayers to God for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of Calvary, who gave up himself for us. It's a good idea for us to use our hymnals, as did so many of our forebears, as a prayer book for our daily lives. And finally, we Christians ought to pray because prayer changes things. Scripture makes it clear that prayer has a great opportunity or gives a great opportunity for us to take the things of this world to our God in prayer. Now, human reason tainted by sin says, well, God already knows what he's going to do. God already has his will, so why would you and I pray as if that would make any difference at all? But our faith, on the other hand, believes God's word that is declared here in James, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Harry Emerson Fosdick, a popular preacher in the earliest 20th, early 20th century, wrote in one of his books that it is heathenish to pray for rain. Well, what does God's word say? Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Again, there are many places in the Bible that talk about the prayers of men changing things in connection with God's will. The example that came immediately to my mind as I was thinking about this sermon was Moses. Think how many times Moses interceded for God's people when the Lord had had about enough. And the Lord interceded on behalf of God's people. And humanly speaking, God then listened to Moses and did not bring his judgment down on God's people, but continued his mercy to them and granted the requests of Moses' prayer. We can think of many other examples in the scripture. Prayer changes things. We go to God in prayer and God listens to our prayer and Jesus says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it. He will do it to the glory of his name through me. You and I don't pray alone or with other Christians, secure in the knowledge that God has already made up his mind what he's going to do, and so prayer essentially is a waste of time. Why should we even bother to pray? We bother to pray because from our point of view, from our side, prayer does change things as we take our wants and our needs and our concerns to God in prayer.
God promises to hear us and give us the things that we need and often ask for to the glory of his name. These two things are true. God knows his will and he will do it. And the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. This all might be very difficult to explain to someone. It is really beyond, isn't it, our limited human understanding. But it is certain that it is true. You know, unbelievers look upon prayer as sort of a uh, break the glass in case of emergency and hope somebody shows up to help. Well, we Christians, we children of God, know that that's not true. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire. God wants us to pray. We need the Lord's help. Prayer changes things. So, let us pray. Amen. And now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.